Voyager. Boy, did I love that platform. And uh, you know that uh, I've talked about it many a time on this channel. And now it looks like we're coming to the final resolution as it looks like Voyager is going to be picked up by Binance US. And this is good news. And it's, uh, it's a long time coming. And we just had to be patient. And here we are. This is what we got. This just happened uh, yesterday. This was an article that was updated last night. Binance US can move ahead with plan to acquire Voyager Digital's assets, Judge Rules. And I got to tell you, before we get going, I got to give a hand to Judge Wiley. Uh, this, is the, this is the judge, and we're going to talk about this in the article, but he stood up to the SEC counsel and said, basically, what are you doing here? Why are you trying to disrupt this? I'm going to move this, this forward. If you didn't give guidance, that's on you. Grab some bench. You guys are rookies. So I give all the props of the world to Judge Wiley, and it just shows you that one person can truly make a difference. So here's what we got for the article itself. Uh, so Voyager, in a deal with over a billion dollars, uh, is going to be going through. And again, Michael Wiles, he is the judge, overruled various objections to the proposed acquisition. Uh, the judge said he would still work through the confirmation order. He indicated he was in favor of approving the, the deal, but Binance US may still have to clear certain regulatory hurdles before the deal can be finalized, but it's looking quite positive. Good news for creditors. Voyager lawyers are saying that creditors could potentially make a 73% recovery. That's up from 51%. However, people like uh, myself, uh, uh, regulars from Texas and New Jersey who live there have warned those benefits could be significantly dampened uh, if FTX's Alameda Research succeeds in clawing back $445 million in loan repayments made before its own bankruptcy filing in November. So there's always a catch, but we'll see if they can actually do it. But all you got to do is just stay positive. Good things will happen. So topics such as whether personal data will be handed over to Binance US was a a problem that uh, the regulators and the lawyers saw. Creditors quiz Voyager's financial advisors, how to treat exotic kinds of crypto assets, how to deal with customers in states such as New York, Texas, Vermont, and Hawaii, where regulators don't let Binance US operate. And uh, this is from what I read, this is what they're going to say. If you live in those states, they're going to give Binance US so much time to get a money transmitter license. If they cannot get it at that time and you are staying in that state, then what it's going to be is you're not going to get that crypto. You're going to get the dollar amount for that crypto. Now, how that's going to work uh, remains a mystery to me, but I'll update you as soon as I know. So then to finish up this article, other obstacles to deal mainly placed by wary regulators. Wary regulators appear to have fallen away. Judge Wiles took a dim view of objections from the SEC. The hearing, which began on Thursday, gave various parties and regulators a chance to uh, object the proposed sale. The judge ruled these ob objections did not make a strong argument or they would not have, would have unnecessarily bogged down proceedings. This is what I was talking about. Congratulations to one person who stood up to the SEC. And he says, look, if the government wants to litigate that, talking about how the SEC thought the VGX token was a security, uh, they can do so. But he said, look, uh, the regulators did not choose to do that, nor did they give any clear cut guidance. So I'm just going to let this pass. And that's essentially what happened. And that's why the deal is going forward. Concerns raised by parties, including the possibility of Voyager's customer data, including social security would be shared with Binance US and maybe stored in an offshore database. An attorney representing Binance said employees would not have access to this type of of information or said no Binance US employee would have access to information. So look, this is a win. I'll take it as a win. Unfortunately, these are the growing pains that we go through. So I'm glad this actually happened. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And so there's some more good news as far as legal matters. Now, if you're unaware, uh, Grayscale, Bitcoin Trust, they wanted to do a spot ETF. And the SEC said no, because you guys got to prove there's no market manipulation. And I thought to myself, <laughs> In these markets, there's no market manipulation. Okay, SEC, sure. Just look at your banks. Anyhow, uh, it looks like Grayscale is winning this argument. So this is what's going on in the court case thus far. So an element of the SEC's argument is that Grayscale's application lacked data necessary to confidentially determine whether fraud and manipulation in the spot markets impacts the future markets. Judge Rao said it seems the futures price of Bitcoin is a derivative of the asset spot price. And they move together 99.9% .9 of the time. She said the SEC has not provided evidence that Grayscale's claims are wrong. 
And that is a positive because if they can say that you guys haven't brought enough information, it means they can overrule this. And I'm surprised, surprise, Grayscale is on the path to getting approved for a spot Bitcoin ETF, which I thought would never happen. To continue on, it says it seems like there's quite a bit of information on how these markets work together. And the commission really needs to explain and how it understands the relationship between Bitcoin futures and the spot price of Bitcoin. Yes, he sees the denial of Grayscale's application to convert Grayscale Bitcoin into a spot marked Bitcoin ETF contradicted previous decisions, giving the green light for futures. Again, America has greenlit the futures ETF like it's no problem, but for some reason that spot ETF just doesn't go through. He described the SEC's denial as a definition of arbitrary decision making. This is the lawyer from Grayscale, arguing that Grayscale's spot ETF would pose the same risk of fraud and manipulation that currently approved Bitcoin products that trade on the CME. So I like these two stories. This is, again, uh, the legal issues that are presented to ourselves in this market. I think it's a step in the right direction as we push back the SEC. And then lastly, to look at the macro events, uh, we know that great that uh, Jerome Powell just spoke yesterday. And this was a piece that I didn't hear too much about. But I found it interesting that Jerome Powell who was talking to uh, legislators said, hey, we, we should not stifle innovation, especially crypto. Here's what he said. He goes, look, we see fraud. We see lack of transparency. We see run risk, lots and lots of things like that in the crypto and digital asset market, as he was talking Tuesday before the Senate Committee on Banking. Uh, the Fed told regulated U.S. financial institutions to be wary and to take great care in the ways that they engage with the whole crypto space, meaning they're warning everybody like, hey, if you're going to do this, just be careful. I see no problems with that. That's actually sound advice. Why, honestly, Powell said that regulators shouldn't go so far as to hamper technological advancement and that Congress should create a legal framework for digital assets. We don't want regulation to stifle innovation in a way that just favors incumbents and that kind of thing. Hopefully, Gary Gensler is watching the show again and he listens to that. And here's that from the head of the SE, or the head of the Fed chair. On Tuesday, Powell said the stable coins could find a place in the financial service sector if properly regulated. People are going to assume when they deal with something that looks like a money market fund that it has the same regulations as a money market fund or a bank deposit. I couldn't agree more. So again, three positives looking forward for what's happening in the macro and the legal uh, space. But because of Jerome's uh, talk yesterday, apparently, this is from Ben over in his Twitter, Twitter uh, account, he says, look, odds of a 50 basis points rate hike in March are now at 72%. It's amazing. When Jerome Powell was talking, everybody was like, eh, it's, just, it's not going to be that big of a deal. But now all of a sudden, these new numbers come out. And it, used, it was like 32.6% that people thought it would be a 50 basis point hike. And like 66 something percent was 25. Well, now that's flipped. Now everybody's expecting this. So it's amazing what one man can do in that space. I'm interested think about that in the comments. Now let's get into a little bit more of the recession talk. Because I got to tell you, I'm not, I think that there's a recession coming, but there are some data points that just don't add up. And what I'm talking about, this is a great article from Bloomberg. And they talked about how global liquidity drain is coming from markets. And they talk about how there was a one trillion rise in central bank reserves boosted by risky assets. And the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, and the People's Bank of China injections are done. So what they're saying here is that it's just not the Fed that prints money. It's just America. I mean, we just print a lot of it and we're good at it. But it's also these other central banks that within the last six to nine months have injected one trillion into the market. And we have to be respectful of just how much money that actually is. And that's what they're saying is propping up some of the market. So there's from city strategist, Matt King. He says in a report published Sunday, interventions in recent months undertaken by the Bank of Japan, People's Bank of China, added almost a trillion in central bank reserves. The origins of this year's risk rally lie in obscure technicals driving central bank liquidity. At this point, we think most of the boost to reserves is done. This implies that the story for the rest of the year should return to being one of liquidity drainage and risk weakness. Because I was always wondering, I'm like, why is there such a nice little rally going on? People would say, well, it's just a bear, it's just a bear rally. But maybe it has to do with something with these central banks globally 
injecting a trillion dollars and causing liquidity. And we take a look here, the central bank balance sheet stabilized. And we're taking a look, this is in billions. So this is 23, 26 trillion dollars. As we go to the far right side of 2022, in January, you can see how it kind of just kind of ticks up and there's a, even more liquidity coming in towards the end of 2021 and into 2022, and then down here a little bit. And then it's a little bit of a pickup right in this way going into the end or December. Now, if we take a look at the Bitcoin price of 2022, actually in 2022, 2023, you can see it was pretty flat. And then just like how there was a little bit of a, of a t uptick, which isn't much, I mean, a trillion, considering that we have 23 trillion there, but it is enough to do just a little bit in January, which is what happened, and off to the races we were. Now, is this going to last? Well, this article seems to think that it doesn't, but if it's not just liquidity, maybe it's some macro factors. And if you're worried about the recession, we've talked to death yesterday about the inversions of, of treasury yields, the 10 and 2s. But there's two things that we didn't talk about, and that was uh, new housing prices and vehicles. The things that will lead you in and take you out of these recessions are some pretty big driving factors as far as like the houses. Because think about this, as far as construction, the houses that are built, the people that are employed, the agents, the construction companies, the, uh, the banks and everybody that's involved with these different houses for sale, it's a large part of the economy. Also the same thing with vehicles. But if we take a look here, Again, Ben's website, links in the description, you can check it out. You can see here that if we're looking at houses for sale, well, first of all, what this is, is that it's a ratio. If the example is, if the ratio is eight, like we have someplace over here, if the ratio is eight, then that means for each new house sold, there are eight new houses for sale. And if we can take a look here, you can see that just looking at like the baseline, just eyeballing it, you can see that it looks like the baseline's around four, roughly four. You got four here, four here, four here. In, in the trough, what do we got over here? Five, four, 4.8. You got 4.7 over here, just roughly around four. So for every house sold, you got four new houses. And what's interesting is that if we take a look at the last economic crisis, the Great Recession, and uh, 2007, eight and nine, you can see that we had a massive amount of houses. And actually down here, you had about 7.8, which is pretty like on the lower point. And then it peaked out at around 12 or so, 12.2. So for every house being sold, you had a boatload of houses that were just sitting around uh, that were not being sold. You had 12 houses. Now it could have, you, you can't uh, absorb that much uh, unless you have like a super strong economy. At that point, we did not. And then it just went right back down to 7.9, 7.8. Then it came back up. And then it kind of came down to that baseline of around four. If I take a look here at where we're at right now, I mean, we peaked out in July 2022 at 10, which is not the all-time high, which you saw over here around 12. And right now, as of the latest numbers of uh, end of or the first of January, we're again back down to seven, seven point nine. So this narrative about a recession coming, it could very well be, but right now it doesn't look like uh, there's a an oversupply of houses right now. I think things are slowing down. I think the builders kind of figured it out. Like, look, these rates are going up. Uh, I think it's around seven percent for a mortgage rate right now. And if that's too high, then people aren't going to want to buy houses. On the flip side. Uh, people aren't going to want to sell their houses because why would I sell my house if I then have to get a new house and pay for an exorbitant amount in, in mortgage rates? So I don't see why people would do that. I think it's just going to drop off at a slower rate. And that's just the housing part. So honestly, it's not looking too horrible so far. And then vehicle sales, and this is in millions. You can see that we're around uh, 11 million in 2010 come back over here, 12 million, so on and so forth. And then, of course, in the uh, pandemic, we only had around, oh, look at that, only only almost 9 million. Again, we're not exorbitantly high. We're not super far up there. We're at 15 or so million, which is a little bit high to say, but not awful. So again, when we take a look at these things and say, well, the recession is definitely upon us, I don't know. I'm not for sure. I will say this. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know where things are going, but... There was some pretty good piece of information uh, that I gleaned from yesterday's uh, comments. This is from, uh, well, there's two. One was uh, David's kid said, no to retail clawbacks. Yes, to Simon Dixon. Shout out to Simon Dixon for the Celsius plan, putting together 
And uh, Jackal said this. He said, look, I've been working a second job since October, preparing for a recession, trying to double up on my house payment and paying off my car. My goal is to stay solvent in my Bitcoin DCA and try not to use all my dry powder when and if we get a significant dip. Stay humble, stack sats, and stay solvent, friends. And uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. So look, that's it for today's video. And uh, I know it's a little bit long, you know, going over the different pieces, but I think there's some really good things to glean from this as far as like the legal and the macro. As far as are we going to see a recession? Anybody's guess. That's why dollar cost average and just think to myself, well, I got a two to five year horizon. I think things will be okay. So that's it for today. So first of all, thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. Like it, subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next one.